Carpenters Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. Glory to God. Oh, blessed be God. Blessed be God. Blessed be God. Oh, glory, 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 glory. Glory to God. Glory to God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I just heard in my heart that there's someone with a lump on their breast. I just heard that. Every head bowed. A lump on your breast. Can I see your hand up? I'll pray for you. I'll minister to you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. A lump on your breast. Ushers, can you help me? Ushers, can you help me? I'm being pointed to a hand where? Rave the hand well. God, I see your hand. In the name of Jesus, you are healed. I command you to be healed. Lump dematerialize right now in the name of Jesus. Be every whit whole. Jesus makes you whole. Right now in his mighty and matchless name. Amen. Just lift your hands and thank him. Blessed be God. Father, your name is praised. Glory to your name. Amen. Anybody ready for the word this morning? Praise God. Turn with me your Bibles to Ephesians 1.19 and Ephesians 3.20. These verses serve as a foundation text for what we want to study. We want to pick up a study today and a few weeks after now. Ephesians 1.19, Ephesians 3.20. These have to be some of your favorite verses in the word of God. They're just some verses that must be dear to your heart. And these ones are some of them. Ephesians 1.19, if you have it, say amen. amen. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? And then in Ephesians 3.20, the word of God says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. I want you to notice in Ephesians 1.19, it speaks about the exceeding greatness. Can you say that, please? Then in Ephesians 3.20, it speaks about exceedingly abundantly above. Can you say that, please? I want to speak to us on what I have titled Living Beyond the Mark. Living Beyond the Mark. Living Beyond the Mark. When we speak about a mark, we're talking in this context, in the relation of what we want to study, we're speaking about a boundary, amen? A limitation, a bar, you know? This is as far as you can go and no further. Boundaries, limitations. From what we see from the word of God, and from the verses we're going to be sharing today, and from these foundational verses we've seen, there is a provision for us in God, or everything God has done for us, and every provision he has made for us is beyond the bar, is beyond the mark. What I mean is, if God is to do something that requires 50, God doesn't do 50. I thought you'd say amen to that. God will do, to say God will do a million is an understatement. And what we see from the word of God is that there is an excess in God such that what you experience, there is no limit to what can happen to you. There's no limit to what you can experience if you believe and embrace this fact that God does things excessively and therefore your own life is meant to be a life that is over and above, uh, over and above a life that is beyond the bar, a life that is beyond limits and beyond the mark. Praise God. The reason for this is because God himself has no limits. Amen. God himself, his very nature is excessive, if I can put it that way. Do you know that God has no limits? The only limits that God has are the limits he has placed on himself. Amen. A good limit is that when he says he will forgive your sins and remember them no more. 
So God has chosen him to use his power to erase and delete his memory. That is what God does with his will. So when we approach God, we should not come to God with the idea that there are limits on him because there are absolutely no limits. And we're going to find out that when God does things and in the provisions he has made for us, his children, he has gone over, 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 over and above. In fact, put it this way, language cannot comprehend and compound what God has done for us and how excessively he has made these provisions available to us. Can you say amen? That's why the verse talks about the exceeding greatness of his power. Now unto him who is able to do what we ask or think. Is that what he says? Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above. This is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible because it just compounds together words, terms of exaggeration, yet God does not exaggerate. So if he says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above, then be sure that he's able to do that and he's going to do that for you. Amen. Amen. Now, the key word we need to understand that serves as the, uh, the key that opens up this treasure chest of truth that we want to study is the word hooper, H-U-P-E-R. Just write that down. And I'm, going to t- I'm telling you that for a reason because it's going to keep on coming up in everything that we are going to discuss that word hooper is found there in Ephesians 1.19, exceeding greatness. That is the Greek word hooperbalo, which means to throw beyond the usual mark. Exceeding. Exceeding there, not exceeding greatness. I'll come to greatness when we touch on that. But exceeding means to throw beyond the usual mark. The picture that comes to my mind is, how many of you play football here? You're a goalkeeper and they're about to take a penalty shot. You know, and you are, you know, you know the way goalkeepers dance. Which side is it going to go? And the player just plays it. You know, World Cup now. You know, the, 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 the player plays it. And instead of it entering the goalpost, what does he do? He goes over and above. Now, that is an over, over and above the, 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 the team playing doesn't want. But it is, that gives a perfect picture of over and above. Amen. It's like telling a little child to catch a ball that goes 12 feet above him. Because no matter how far he jumps, what that ball, there's no way he can catch it. Amen. So God is able to do kupabalo. Throws beyond the limit. Can you say amen? And then when he says to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, Ephesians 3.20, exceedingly abundantly is kupaperosis. Sorry, kupaperisos. Don't bother about the, I'm saying this for a meaning. Hooperbalo, hooperperosis. Is there a similar, similarity in the sound? Is there a similarity? What's the similarity? Hooper, hooper. So that is the key word. And if you study through the epistles, this word is used several times, especially by the Apostle Paul. God is able to do that. That word means two things. Number one, substitution. That word hooper means it's used in the context of substitution. For he made him to be sin for us. For us. That's the word hooper. Who knew no sin? That we might be made the righteousness of God. That's substitution. But we're not talking about the context of substitution today. What we are talking about is the second one, which is what we are beginning to look at, which speaks about something that goes beyond the usual mark. Can you say amen? Praise the Lord. So, God has made great provisions available to us. And he has made them excessively, excessively, over and abundant. Such that in the light of the provision and the resources that God has made available to us. Listen church, victory is certified. Victory is guaranteed. Not just victory, excessive victory victory. Praise God. In the light of this truth, I say to you, church, you don't have a reason to fail. I thought you'd say amen to that. You don't need to be afraid of failure because the way God has configured it, the way God has set up the system, you are bound to succeed. You are bound to make it. You are bound not just to survive. 
You are bound to be a victor more than a conqueror. Because God has made ab uh, uh, abilities, resources over and above. So there should be no limits in your life. Praise the Lord. Now, I want us to, what we are going to be doing in this message, in these messages, is that we're going to be looking at some of these provisions that God has made for us that will help us live beyond the mark. The first one I want us to see is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, which is the first point we will be discussing today. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. 2 Corinthians 3, and the first point is the excelling glory of the New Testament. The excelling glory of the New Covenant. Let me put it that way. The excelling glory of the New Covenant beyond the mark. 2 Corinthians 3, if you have it, say amen. Look from verse 7 to 11. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance or his face, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Now look at verse 10. For even that which was made, sorry, for even what was made glorious, that is the old covenant, had no glory in this respect, that is in light of the new covenant, because of the glory that excels. Notice that. The glory that does what? Excels. For if what was passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Do you see the several comparative words used in that text? Do you see that? It says in verse, uh, verse 7, uh, sorry, verse 8, the ministry of the Spirit be not be more glorious. Verse 9, much more glory. Then verse 10, the glory that excels. Can you see after me? The glory that excels. The glory that excels. Who does the glory that excels belong to? Who does it belong to? It belongs to us. What is Paul discussing in this text? Paul is comparing and contrasting the old covenant with which covenant, please? The new covenant. Let me ask you, which covenant are you under? The old covenant or the new covenant? The new covenant. If somebody stood before you and said, this is a, these are covenants, this is the old one or this is the new one, which one should you, without telling you to make a choice, which one should you take? The new covenant. Why is the new covenant a, a superior covenant to the old? Because it has a glory that by far exceeds the old covenant's glory, such that when you juxtapose them, place them side by side, the old covenant, like Paul said in verse 10, had no glory in the light of the new covenant. Can you say amen? Had no glory. Now, when he says that the Old Testament covenant, the old covenant had glory, what is he referring to? Please write Exodus 19, 16 to 25 down and Exodus 34, 33 to 35. Exodus 19, 16 to 25. There it shows us that when God inaugurated the covenant, when that covenant was inaugurated in Exodus 19, there were several things that happened. We don't have the time to read it. But if you read that text, it shows us that God himself came down to Mount Sinai. Because that was where the law was given. God descended and there were thunders. Say thunders. Lightning. Say lightning. Smoke. There was smoke. There was fire. Let me ask you, what are these things? They are manifestations of the glory of God. They are manifestations of his person and his presence. In fact, it says God himself descended on that mountain and the mountain quaked. 
When the mountain quaked, the people were afraid. And Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that even Moses himself said, I exceedingly fear and quake. And when that glory came down, you see, instead of the people running towards God, what do you think happened? They belted off. They took off. Because that glory, though it was the glory of God, though it was the manifest presence of God, was not a glory that so much attracted. Amen. But it was glory, God's manifestation, the weight of the presence of God. The people took off. Paul is saying that the glory we have in Christ Jesus exceeds that one. Also, the verse tells us that that glory was such that when Moses went into the presence of God, the holy place, the tabernacle, to speak with God, the face of uh, uh, his face began to shine and became very luminous, very bright. And when he came out to the people, the people could not see his face. So they had, Moses had to go and cover his face and speak to them through a veil. But glory to God, the Bible tells us in that same second chapter, uh, second Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18, it says, but we all with open face, beholding as in a mirror, what are we beholding? The glory, the glory of God, we are being changed into that same excelling glory from one level of glory to another level of glory. Hallelujah. The glory of God, the glory of the new covenant. You see, the glory of the new covenant is not so much in people falling, in people running away. The glory of the new covenant is in the relationship that it breeds between us and with Jehovah God. Look at what he says there. There are two descriptions Paul gives about the old covenant that had glory. Firstly, he calls it a ministry of death. Say after me, ministry of death. If you heard of a ministry of the government called ministry of death, what would you do? <laughs> a ministry of death, a service of death. Why did Paul call the old covenant a ministry or a ministration of death? Because the law could not give life. Amen. Are you following me, church? We're comparing so that you know the glory of God and the things that God has made available to you for you to enjoy victory in your life. Amen. So why did he call it the ministry of death? Firstly, it was given to a spiritually dead people. Spiritually dead people. Now, this is the thing. Somebody who is dying, what do you need to give to him? Please, what do you, if a person dying, what do you give him? Death or life? You give him life. But it seems that even though these people were spiritually dead, God, could not, God didn't give them life. The Lord did not give them life. Let me ask you, was it that God did not want to give them life? Did God want to give them life? So why did the, who gave the law, the devil or God? Who gave the law, the devil or God? God. So why did God give them something that would minister death? The thing is this. The law could not give life. And so it was just, God was waiting for Jesus to come. Because Jesus said, I have come that they might have life. The only person who gives life is who? Jesus. The law does not give life. What the law, was, what the law did at best is that it, it's kind of like somebody who has a terminal condition and the doctors tell you there is no hope for you. We have not discovered the cure. But we can give you some injections. We can be helping you small, small. Ultimately, you will still die. Oh. But at least there is the possibility. You know, doctors never tell you 100%. Amen now. They don't give you 100%. They will tell you even though it seems 100%, we must still make room for 1% because something may go wrong and they need to clear themselves. So if something goes wrong, they say, okay, you are one of the few stat statistics. So God gave them something. Unfortunately, the medication, so to speak, had side effects. You understand? Somebody has a terminal condition. You're treating them. They're not, going to, they're not going to leave. They're not going to be cured. But that medication has side effects. The pharmacist told me once that there is no medication without side effects. 
Side effect. That's why you shouldn't put your faith in medication. God can use doctors. God can use medical practitioners. But don't you go to them trusting exclusively in them because they make mistakes. Their knowledge is limited. But the point is this. That law still eventually killed them. Let me give you an example. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. It was a ministration of death. Romans 7 verse 10. So when you want to live your life by do's and don'ts, by bringing yourself under man-made regulations, what are you coming under? What are you coming under? The law, bondage, and effect you are coming under the ministration of death. What should be ministered to you? Life. And as long as you allow death uh, be ministered to you, you will not find the life in you, will not find expression. Romans 7 verse 10. And the commandments, in place of commandment, we could say law, okay? And the law which was to bring life, I found to bring what? To bring death. So Paul thought that as an ardent Jew who obeyed the law, that if he complied with the laws of Moses, he was going to find life. But as he lived by those laws, what did he find out? Death. Now, what kind of death was Paul talking about? Not physical death, but spiritual death, because he was still alive when he was referring to this time, in, uh, 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 this time past. So he said, before I accepted Christ, at that time when I was practicing the law, the law kept on ministering death to me. How many of you know that if you have struggled with a habit before or some bad disposition, as long as you comply with do's and don'ts, how many of you know that you actually become weaker to overcome it? If, you are, if I have a witness, can I see your hand up? And all of you who didn't raise your hands up, God will have mercy on you, forgive and pardon you. Yes, with the best of us, if you could say so, have been there. Oh, don't do this, don't do this. That's why God does not give us uh, 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 habit transformation. He gives us a brand new nature. He makes us a new creation. If, you are strugg- if you've been struggling with any habit, the way to get over it is not by fast 10 times a day or do these kind of things. First of all, become a new creation. If you are now a new creation, the nature of God within you, the glory of the new covenant empowers you against what has come against you. Can you say amen? So he calls it the ministration of death. The next thing he calls it in that, in that text, that is in verse, uh, verse uh, 9, is the ministration of condemnation. So the law was a ministration of condemnation. The new covenant is a ministry of what? Look at that verse 9. Ministry of condemnation versus what, please? Ministry of, ministration of righteousness. Righteousness. What is righteousness? What is righteousness? Right standing with God. Let me ask you. The Old Testament saints, were they righteous? Were they righteous? Or let, me, let, let me put it this way. Did the law make anybody righteous? It didn't. Instead, the law condemned. In fact, in In society today, the law is mainly an instrument of justice. Condemnation. If you don't know the law, if you get into court, you'll be afraid. In fact, as you approach the court, you know the symbol of justice? A blind, folded woman with a sword on one hand and what on the other one? Scale. So a person who is already liable, you know, charged with an offense, approaches the court the first day and he says this. He said, my own don't finish. Because there's a sword in one hand and there's scale. That means that scale is telling you that the law is going to give you what you deserve. The law doesn't give you mercy. The judge can commute a sentence, but if you are found guilty, the only thing that can revert that is what is called a prerogative of mercy. Listen. 
the law condemned. The more people practice the law, that's the same thing. When you practice do's and don'ts, live according to moral codes outside of Jesus Christ, you feel condemned. Do you know why? Because the law does not empower you to overcome it. The Bible says that when we were helpless, when we were without strength, what happened? Christ died for us. When we were adunatos, we didn't have power to save ourselves from sin. What did God do? He sent his son to die for us. So that Romans 8 says that what the law could not do in that it was weak according to the flesh, God did by condemning sin in the flesh of his son. So the law could not make anybody righteous, but it deceived people. The Bible says the man that lives, the man that does them shall live in them. But it was a deception because the more you did it, the more you did it, the more you did it, the more condemned you feel you felt. And you can, the law gives you 10. If you fail in one, according to God, you have failed everything. So it doesn't, there is no difference to God if a glass, you know, this is an analogy, a glass, you know, shield, I mean the glass of a car, whether it was cracked by a pebble or broken by a big stone. The point is it is broken. It is condemned totally unfit for use. But glory to God, Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ came and he gave us right standing with God apart from the law, apart from what we do. Amen, church. And this is the greater glory that is available today, that you have a standing with God that nobody else had and that your performance, your do's, your don'ts did not give you that standing and your do's and don'ts, listen, church, cannot remove that standing. Some of us agree with the fact that my do's and don'ts will not give me that standing. But if I break it, I will get what I deserve. That is justice. That is the law. Christ came to give us grace and he came to give us mercy. Can you say amen today? Now, notice something else before we proceed. Paul says, look at verse 9, for verse 10 actually. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. Say after me, the glory that excels. What, what glory is that? The glory of the new covenant. The glory that belongs to us in Christ. Now, if you read the Bible, the glory of God is often described with different expressions. One of which is light. For instance, the light that shone on Moses' face. Are you following me? Good. Now, you see, there are different kinds of light. The glory of the law, the glory of the old covenant, is similar to the light of a lamp or a candle. If you enter a dark room, there's, there is no power. It's dark night. Power holding company is, is fulfilling their... Uh, okay. Is withholding night, light for that night. There is no power. If you put on a matchstick, do you have light? And you put a candle. Do you have light? You have light. You have light. You have light. No, it's not a trip question. Do you have light? You have light. You have light. You have light. What can that light do for you? Let me ask you. Your parlor is as big as this stage. That is the only single light you have. You have furniture here. You have your beautiful lamp here. You have all these furnishings, is it likely that you may bump into something even though you have light? Okay. Maybe you even have these rechargeable lights. You put that on. It's very likely you are going to see the whole place. But can the light still be brighter than that? Can it be? You can have an inverter. You put on the inverter, if it is sufficiently charged, the light is going to come on brighter, correct? Better still, you can have a generator. And you put on your generator, hopefully your generator is not, I better pass my neighbor. If it's a good generator, what's likely to happen? The light will even become brighter, brighter. What am I saying? The old covenant had glory. But compared to the glory of the new, it is comparing a matchstick or a candlestick light 
versus the light of a flood light. Are you following me? Such that comp- that matchstick light or that candle light compared to the flood light, is it really light? That's why Paul said, even that which had glory has no glory in this respect. Such that whatsoever light the Old Testament offered pales into insignificance, is totally swallowed up, subsumed, and eclipsed by the greater glory of the new covenant we have with Jesus. When God created the earth, the Bible says he made two lights. One to rule the night, one to rule the day. The lesser light, what do you, would you have thought? The, letter, the lesser light should rule the day. Because there is darkness at night. But the lesser light, the moon, rules the night. When the moon is up, do you still need light? Do you still need light? When the sun is up in the day, do you need light again? No. The lesser light is the old covenant, the glory of the old. The greater light is the son of righteousness, Jesus, who has arisen with healing on his wings. So during the period where there was spiritual darkness, God didn't give them the greater light. He gave them the lesser light. The reason why there is light under the new order is because he who is light has arrived. The Lord Jesus Christ himself. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Now the crux is this. If under the glory that has faded away, that has passed away, they had miracles, they had signs, they had wonders, they had the supernatural, then I submit to you that placed side by side what we have in Christ, it is totally incomparable. Amen. If before Jesus Christ came, God could multiply the widow's oil, two widow's oil, in the new covenant, God is set to do by far exceedingly abundantly because that was a glory that has passed away that God has set aside the glory that subsists today will do that and much 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 forever much more glory to God so by being a born again Christian under the new covenant of grace you are positioned to experience greater glory Glory that has never been seen before. And listen, glory that becomes greater and more intense. That is what God has for you. Can you say amen? Amen. That's number one. Number two. Oh, glory to God. Glory, 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 glory. Look with me at Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. So the first thing is the excelling glory of the new covenant. Number two, this is going to be a great blessing to you. Philippians 2, verse verse 8. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 8. If you have it, say amen. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, say therefore. Like somebody said, when you see it, therefore, ask what it is there for. Good. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him. Highly exalted him. Number two, the highly exalted name above all names. The highly exalted name above all names. These, this is something God has given to us that has furnished us for victory, certain victory. Again, that expression, highly exalted, is from the Greek word, hooper, hoopso. 
Don't bother writing. Hooper, hoopso. Does that sound similar to what we have seen? What, what, what's the similarity? Hooper. Hooper. Now notice that God didn't give him a name that is above every name. God, sorry, God didn't just exalt Jesus Christ. What does the scripture say he did? He has highly exalted him. That word, that expression, highly exalted, means, if you're right, to write this down, to elevate above others, to raise to the highest position, to exalt to the highest rank and power. Oh, glory to God. To elevate above others, to raise to the highest position, to exalt to the highest rank and power. To raise to supreme majesty. To raise to supreme majesty. Now let me ask you. The scripture is saying God has highly exalted who, please? Jesus. Why did God exalt Jesus? Why did he give him a name? Or Sorry, sorry. Why did he give him the name? It's not a name, oh. The name. Why did he give him the name above every other name? Why did he do that? Talk to me, please. Why did God highly exalt Jesus? Was Jesus highly exalted for himself? Was he? Was he highly exalted for himself? Who was he exalted for? For us. Now, let me ask you. If you begin reading from verse 5, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ, who being in the form of God, did not count it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, you know, and humbled himself. Verse, verse, verse 8 tells us. He humbled himself. Why did Jesus humble himself? He humbled himself to the point of death. Is Jesus Christ God? Is he God? Good. But according to this text, when he says he humbled himself, he became obedient to death. Was that as God or as man? Sorry? As man. Because as God, he had a position with the Father co-equal with him. Because he was God and he is God. Sorry, language sometimes is not sufficient, but you get the point. So he emptied himself of his heavenly prestige and he became a man. Why did he become a man? So that he could die. Why did he die? So that he could pay what justice demanded for our emancipation and for our liberation. There, that is verse, uh, verse 8. Then verse 9 says, therefore, that means as a result of him humbling himself, God exalted him and gave him the name. It seems to say to me that God gave him that name because of us. Because of the reason for which he died in the first place. He died for us. Therefore, when God raised him back, raised him from death into life, he was not only restored back to his position as God before the earth began, it suggests that God now gave him a reserved name. A name that was reserved for somebody. And the only person who could fit that bill, who could qualify to become that person anyway, was Jesus. Was God himself. But God gave him a name, not so much for himself, but he gave him a name for us. For us. For us. Because when God exalted him, guess what happened? God exalted you together with him. So when he says God has highly exalted him, giving him a name that is above all names, Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that God did all of that for the benefit of the church, for us. So listen to me, church. You have a name that is exalted above every other name. I'll say that again. You possess an authority that nobody else possesses except those who are born again. I thought you'd say amen to that. If you know you possess that authority, listen, nobody can threaten you. Nobody can intimidate you. Nobody can bully you. 
Demons can't press you on your bed at night. Oh, I'm being bullied. The demons, if you know this, listen, if you have a name that is above every name, the thing you are seeking deliverance from, you're already delivered from it. And you will look it in the face and say, no trespassing. Don't you know who I am? The demon said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Because Paul was in Jesus. Demons say, Jesus, I know. Sister Mina, I know. Brother Anjuma, I know. They know you. But the thing is this. Do you know who you are? The devil knows he's defeated. The devil knows he doesn't have the authority. But does the devil still try? Does he try? Of course he tries. To see if you know. Because one of his greatest, the greatest tactics he has is consistency. Consistency. You know a person can so weary you that you say, I give up. I surrender. That's what the devil does. But Jesus has given you a name. God has given you a name in Jesus that is above every other name. Look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards what who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So write this down. Jesus has the highest authority. Jesus has the highest authority. Write this down. The scope of his authority covers the three worlds. The scope of his authority covers the three worlds. Do you know that anyone who has authority, the authority they have is limited and is demarcated? Is that correct? How many of you here are parents? You are parents. You have children. You know you have authority in your house. Now talk to me now. <laughs> oh, sure. Ah, you want to flex. You flex for your children. So, if you do that, I will spank you. you. And your word is law in your territory. That is the do your domain. If the children of your neighbors are making noise, Oh, huh. you say, ha, huh, I wish this was my child. For don't hear when. But listen, your authority stops at your door. Are you following? You cannot go to the neighbor's house and exert authority. But listen, Jesus has authority in every realm. Do you know that astrologers, or what do they call these people who study the planetary heavens? What are they called? Astronauts, astrologers. Do you know they keep on discovering new planets? They keep on discovering. Let me tell you a name that has authority there. The name of Jesus. Principalities, oh, powers, oh, dominions, oh, every, any name and every name that is named knows another name. The name of Jesus. Because in every territory, that is the most exalted name. Apart from the fact that all things were made by him and for him, he's the one who has conquered every force of darkness. Over every place. His name also has power over all time, in all times, in all situations, in all seasons. Six months ago, the name President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan, what was it? Was it powerful? Oh, of course. But today, the new man on the block, General, retired General, Mr. Muhammadu Buhari, he's the name that is now the name. Is that correct? And they say that that name wants to indict or probe the other name. That's why politicians, that's what happens. They're in power today. They are blowing siren. Wah, 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 wah. As if they are drugged with deity. 
as though they are God. All they, that needs to happen is for them, for the new power to be sworn in, and they take off. They don't make noise again. Why? Their authority is limited for a period of time. But the scripture says this most majestic, exalted name not only has authority and power in this age and in this time, but in the worlds to come, in the ages to come. So it doesn't matter any demon that has been hatched out of hell. Any problem, does it have a name? Does it have a name? Then there is a name that is exalted above it. The name of Jesus. Some of you are afraid of your future because you have been told in your future the devil is waiting for you. I don't care what devil, demon, principality, power is waiting. I don't care. I have a name that is exalted above every other name. All I need to do is to mention that name in simple faith and every knee will bow in obedience whether it wants or it doesn't want. It must comply to that majestic name. Glory to God. Glory to God. Church, you are fortified. Church, you are fortified. You are exalted. And you can live a life beyond limits. Beyond limits. Beyond the bar. When you make mention of that name, that name just doesn't do what is expected. It does much more than is expected. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Have you learned something this morning? Lift your hands and thank God for what you've heard. Blessed be God. Lift your hands. Thank him. Oh, lift your hands. Thank him. The name above every other name. The greater glory. Say it after me. I have greater glory. I have great, greater glory. Because I belong to the new covenant. I am a new creation. I have the glory of life. By the ministration of the spirit. I have the glory of righteousness. The greater glory. The light that shines brighter. Than all other lights is mine. I have the right to the name of Jesus. The most highly exalted name. Of The name is exalted above things in heaven. On earth and under the earth. Every time I mention that name. The name goes to work for me. And it performs miracles, signs, wonders. Not only in my life, but in the life of others. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. Give him praise and give him glory. Give him praise. Give him glory. Glory to God. Glory to God. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. You're in church today. You're not born again. You do not know Jesus. This Jesus we have spoken about. He's the glory of the new covenant. He's the name above every other name. You don't know him. But you'd like to make that decision today. If that is you, can I see your hand up? I'll pray with you. I'll pray for you. Every head is bowed. All eyes are closed. No one is looking around. Can I see your hand? I'll pray with you. I'll pray for you. I see that hand. God bless you, my sister. Wave that hand if you mean it. Wave it. God bless you. If you want to join this person, can I see your hand up? And I'll pray with you. Somebody else. I see that hand. If your hand is up, wave it well. Let me say, see it. Another hand. Oh, glory to God. Oh, glory to God. If your hand is up, if your hand is up, could you just pick your Bible, your bag, everything you came to church with, and come and meet me right here, and I'll pray with you. If your hand is up, God bless you, my sister. God bless you. Just come right here to the front, and I'll pray for you. Yes, my sister behind, God bless you. The brother there with your hand up. Yes, just stand up. Just come right here. God bless you. God bless you as you come. Come with your Bible, your bag, everything you came to church with, and I'll pray with you. Oh, blessed be God. Blessed be God. Just come. Just come. Just come. Just come. Glory to his name. 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 I said glory to his name. Oh, glory to his name. Blessed be God. Blessed be his name forever. Blessed be his name forever. Just lift your two hands up. In surrender to Jesus. Say these words, meaning every word from your heart. Say after me, oh Lord, I come to you today. Say it out loud. I come to you today in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. And you raised him from the dead for my salvation. 
Jesus, save me now. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Father, for saving me now. In Jesus' name, I pray for them. Father, I pray for these ones as I lay my hands on them. I declare that they will not only prosper, they will also flourish and live the fullness of life Jesus came to give them. In Jesus' name, amen. My brother, my sisters, can you turn around? Can you turn around? Can you follow this young man? Let's receive them to the family of God. Somebody will speak to you and you'll be back right now. <laughs>